NFL Max Radio broadcasting live tonight, Tuesday, December 4th, 2018, as uh, the regular season for the fantasy season is officially over. And we are here, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the postseason as we approach uh, week 14 this week. Ewok Juggernaut's here with the hot pineapples. I know it's been a couple weeks. Uh, we had some conflicting schedules, but we are back. Nick, what's going on, man? Not much. It's uh, been a while, a couple weeks. Some major news broke, obviously, with Kareem Hunt. And then uh, we got just an absolute you know, plethora of injuries to the running back position, which could really change um, the outcome of some seasons here. But it looks like maybe we're going to get Melvin Gordon back in time, which I didn't think would happen. And... We'll see what happens with Connor. Um, that news just broke today that he's out this week, but um, it's been an interesting run here, and uh, we'll see how this season shakes out. Yeah, my sleeper uh, app was going off like crazy with all these injuries, uh, some very significant and some not so much. But nonetheless, uh, you know, we got through a wild week 13, and, um, you know, full steam ahead for the fantasy playoffs here. So, a couple of guys that we'll just jump right into it. A couple of guys that um, had some performances this past week and some unsuspected success. Um, the most glaring one is uh, running back in San Francisco, Jeff Wilson, who had 15 carries, 4.1 yards a carry with 61 yards and nine targets, eight receptions and 73 yards receiving with a receiving touchdown. I mean, Went back and watched that game, and um, it's it's incredible. You know, he looked great statistically. You know, coming from a metric standpoint, not a great athlete, and um, he only played one year in uh, his senior year in college. Although it was very productive that one year, there's really not much to go by. Um, you know, it's a small, uh, isolated sample size, but. Either way, he came out strong this week in PPR, 18 points. So looking ahead here, you know, Brita is always banged up. And there's really not much else going on in San Francisco. So I'm looking at Jeff Wilson here this week against Seattle, who's not that great against the run. And the rest of the stretch, uh, the next three, four weeks, has a pretty nice schedule. So quick thoughts on Jeff Wilson. Yeah, like like you were saying, he's obviously got the opportunity. And like you say, um, you know, opportunity trumps all. Uh, and he's got it right now. And, you know, I don't think he's an over athlete. Like you were saying, his metrics are on, you know, the average side. Um, and he's a little thin. At, I think he's like, a, I think he weighed in at 194 pounds or something of that nature. So he's a little thin. His BMI is very low. Um, we were talking about him earlier. And, you know, he just doesn't strike me as anyone who's the real deal. He'll be fine down the stretch, I think. Um, you know, if, if you need a, a filler for one of those injuries that we were talking about, or, you know, you got hit with a tough break with Kareem Hunt. If you need a guy out of desperation and he's there, um, he's definitely a guy who may be able to fill that role and at least put up a decent week. I don't expect to see the output that he put up today. Um, you know, Nick Mullins with 412 passing yards this past week. Um, you know, I don't know if that's sustainable either. So a lot of those yards were funneled through, um, you know, it's running back. And so we'll see if, if it's the real thing, um, you know, moving forward. But I, I don't suspect this is going to be a long-term solution for the Niners at all um, to any stretch of the imagination. And I think Breed is still the guy to own there um, from a dynasty standpoint. But if you need a what the heck flex moving forward, because you were, you know, decimated at the position, I don't see why not. He's, he's definitely a viable option. Yeah. How often do we see players just come out of nowhere? And down the stretch in the fantasy playoffs, become a league winner for you. And, um, you know, he could be that guy. I mean, they've got him listed at 210. So I don't know, you know, which one is right, but they've got him listed here, 210, six foot. Um, Any other running backs in particular you want to touch on? What about Justin Jackson? 
Yeah, Justin Jackson's an interesting one. Uh, he's a little thin too. Um, you know, doesn't profile as a true lead back, but what you're seeing there is Austin Eckler has, you know, he had the opportunity to take carries and they kind of want to keep him in that optimized role. Um, I think, you know, catching passes out of the backfield, he's a big part of what they do on special teams. He's kind of like their dynamo everything guy. And I think they want to keep him there in that role. Um, so, you know, they call on Justin Jackson and he gets a bulk of the carries and I like the way he runs. Honestly, I, w- I was a fan of Justin Jackson coming out. Um, you know, if I could pick him up in the fourth round, third, late third, fourth round, I was doing it, um, where, you know, Bo Scarborough at the time, we won't talk about that, but he had the upside to, you know, Trump Justin Jackson, but Justin Jackson was, you know, a favorite of mine in that fourth round range if Bo Scarborough was gone, uh, was gone. And, um, now you're seeing him get the opportunity with Melvin Gordon out. We'll see if that happens this week. It sounds like Melvin Gordon might actually have a shot to come back. I would suspect he doesn't, um, and I would suspect he doesn't maybe even play week 15 because that's a Thursday night game. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Melvin Gordon. Um, But if he does end up coming back this week, that's a lot quicker recovery than I anticipated. Um, But, you know, it's fun to get to watch Jackson get a little run, and uh, I had him on a lot of teams going into the season. Um, I cut bait with him once I saw what Austin Eckler was able to do in that back uh, with that backup role, but there was one game where – uh, Melvin was a little dinged up and you didn't see them go to Eckler um, as the bell cow. And from there off spec, I, I went and I picked up Justin Jackson and mm-hmm. a lot of my leagues and I held on to him and it paid off last week. He came up with a good week. Yeah. Anybody who thought that the Chargers were going to lean on uh, Austin Eckler this past week is delusional. Uh, he is what he is. He's Danny Wood at 2.0. Uh, but Justin Jackson looked awesome. I mean, he had like almost eight yards of carry. On Sunday, scored a touchdown. Yeah, he's and, a Waldman uh, favorite, too. He is. I, I loved him, too. Um, in my model, I'm looking him up here. So, I mean, they took him in the seventh round, so it's not like he was undrafted, but, you know, seventh round, whatever. But uh, he runs a 4-5, so he's got some decent wheels on him. He's, you know, sub 200, which isn't good at six foot. But here's where he shines. He's above average in all these categories. Three cone, 6.81. Um, elite top five percentile 20 yard dash and uh, agility burst all well above average. So he's a really good athlete, um, grades out really well. And, um, you know, they it looks like they trust him and he's going to be the guy. So, and you got to think, you know, because the Chargers are going to make a strong push here uh, in the NFL uh, postseason to get into the, the playoffs. Um, Gordon's not going to play. I don't think so. The next couple of weeks. So yeah. And I, I tend to agree. It's like, why would you rush him back? You know, you, you yeah. have a guy who, you know, maybe Justin Jackson, you wouldn't want to roll with him. Had Melvin Gordon gotten hurt in week three, like you're, he's not going to be a guy that you necessarily trust to roll with for an entire season because he is thin. But if you need him for, you know, two or three games, like he's a guy who can get it done for you in a spot start situation like this. And you know, you can feel good about giving Melvin Gordon some time to rest. Like Phillip Rivers has been so on fire. I think anybody can run right now in that offense. And, uh, you know, Phillip Rivers, what he's done this year, if it weren't for Mahomes, he could be the, you know, AFC MVP. Like he's been that good um, yeah. there in LA. And so I just think that anyone can run behind this line right now. And as long as this offense is clicking like it is, I don't see any reason to rush back Melvin Gordon. I think that would be goofy. Um, but I do know that a lot of fantasy owners are hoping that he comes back, obviously. And for them, you know, anyone who does have Melvin Gordon, obviously, you know, I hope he comes back too because he he's the one who probably carried you there. Yeah. I, I mean, staying in LA with the Chargers specifically, uh, with Gordon out, you, you had to assume they're going to throw the ball like mad this past week, and they did. Uh, Rivers had an awesome game and, you know, Keenan Allen, the number one wide receiver in week 13, I mean, 19 targets that that's absolutely insane. 14 receptions, 148 yards and a touchdown. Um, I mean, we all knew this was going to be an awesome matchup for him, especially playing the slot and the way the Steelers, you know, can't cover receivers, um, slot receivers specifically. So, um, down the stretch here again, you know, another guy who has a really nice schedule, Keenan Allen, he's had a really good year. Uh, he's very, you know, what I love about Keenan Allen is his floor. He's such a solid wide receiver. 
uh, you plug them in every week. It's 15 plus every week in a PPR um, this past week, you know, 37 points, which is ridiculous. But um, what do you think? Uh, we haven't talked about Keenan Allen at all this year. Any thoughts on Keenan Allen? Yeah, Keenan's an interesting player. Um, you know, he's kind of always that guy that's that's kind of the afterthought. Um, like if you were to break a tier, he's always like kind of on the bottom of that tier to wide receivers. Um, but he has elite market share and like, there's no one around him really without Hunter Henry. Um, you know, Mike Williams hasn't really taken the step that, you know, I would have liked to see. He's definitely a red zone target, but between the twenties, he's not much of a factor in this offense. I don't love Terrell Williams. Like, I think he's a fine three, um, on a, on a roster. Like, I think he would be great depth. Doesn't like excite me as a two and Travis Benjamin's a one trick pony, especially at this point in his career. He can't even really do that that well anymore. So it's like, what is he really competing with? So when you say 19 targets, it doesn't shock me at all. He's going to have an elite market share. So down the stretch, as long as Keenan Allen stays healthy, which, you know, we're through the season almost now and he stayed healthy. You haven't even heard rumblings of him being dinged up. Um, you know, he always kind of gets a stigma that he's injury prone, but I mean, you haven't even heard really that he's been dinged up this year. So he's running strong. He's, he's run the whole season. Phillip rivers is on fire. I mean, the guy, I think it was, um, he completed 28 of his first 29 passes in a game. It's like ridiculous. He's been hyper efficient. And if you're going to see 19 targets from a quarterback like that, who's on fire right now in this offense with zero minimal competition, that's the formula for a wide receiver one. And so he's very solid moving forward. Yeah, I love him. I got him in a few leagues. Um, I drafted him in a few, a couple startups, and I made a trade for him recently in the uh, NFL Max League. But yeah, you got to love that production. And um, looking forward here down the stretch to help you guys out in the postseason. Uh, staying at the wide receiver position, another wide receiver that had a great week this week, Dante Pettis. Against Seattle, seven targets, five receptions, 129 yards, and two touchdowns. And you can see it's back-to-back weeks now with Dante Pettis where he's become an integral part of this particular passing game with no Jimmy Garoppolo. We talked about him in the preseason um, with Waldman uh, ranking him number one uh, as far as the rookies go at wide receiver. I liked him. I wasn't really in love with him. But uh, what do you think? I mean – has, have we seen enough here from Pettis to think that next year he's going to be, you know, the wide receiver one in that offense? Because, I mean, Marky's good one. The guy's always hurt. He's undersized. I love him to death, but I'm not quite sure he's going to live up to the the hype. Do you remember the Marky's good one hype over the summer? Not quite sure he's going to live up to that kind of hype. But uh, Dante Pettis uh, for the rest of this year and for next year, what are your thoughts? Yeah, he's he's an interesting guy. And like you said, he's a Walden favorite. So honestly, um, I drafted him in a couple spots just because he was a Walden favorite. I didn't necessarily love him, but I was like, you know what? I'll take a shot on him, you know, and, and you know, the late second, if I had a back end second round pick and Washington and Bellage were already gone, um, you know, why not? I'll take a shot on a guy like that if the tight ends were gone. You know, there were some some guys I had targeted ahead of him, obviously, but I did take him in a couple of spots and you know, he's, he's an exciting player. He can do everything. Um, he's kind of like, um, a Josh Reynolds for me from last year. I really liked Josh Reynolds coming out. I thought he could play in the outside. I thought he could play in the slot. He's the kind of guy who's, you know, you see it right now with Cooper cup out. He can mix into the offense and make a difference in, in St. Louis. So Pettis kind of reminds me of that. Like he can do a lot of different things and I don't think he's necessarily going to profile as a one in the NFL, but could he be the number one wide receiver in this offense? Yeah. I think you could see San Francisco go into a situation where they try to keep good and healthy, um, maybe even limit his snaps a little bit. Garcon looks like he's done, um, but it'll be interesting to see in this wide receiver class. There's a plenty of help coming. Um, at this wider receiver class, and let's see what they do. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they address the position because I could see a combo of Pettis, Goodwin, and you know one of these rookies, maybe one of the you know larger guys, um, a Kelvin Herman, or you know even a Brian Edwards, who's you know one of my favorites. You know one of those guys coming in here being the big X receiver, and then you can move Dante Pettis and use him and Goodwin 
you know, kind of flash them around the offense, maybe similar to what the Panthers can do with, you know, Samuel and Moore and McCaffrey. You know, when you get these chess pieces, you just have to have the creative mind. And Kyle Shanahan is the creative mind. He's that kind of coach that can scheme up, you know, production for these kind of guys. So depending on what they do and how they attack the position in the offseason, Dante Pettis is still going to be, you know, someone that I'm looking to, um, you know, for maybe even that upside. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned the Panthers. What about bringing in a guy like Devin Funches, who profiles as that X wide receiver who could play the outside and um, let Pettis, you know, play Z, move him all over the field. Um, And I'm excited to see Garoppolo come back in this offense. You know, Mullins is, is fine. And, you know, you can look at the box score and get all excited with 412 yards and two touchdowns and one interception. Uh, But he's just fine. He's not, you know, he's not going to be an NFL starter, but he's going to be a heck of a backup. And he'll get paid like it for the next 20 years if, you know, Sam Bradford is any indication of anything that the NFL views about at the quarterback position. So, you know, he's fine as a backup, but I'm really excited to watch Jimmy G come back and hopefully have a full year because I liked what I was seeing out of Jimmy G before he got hurt. I did too, um, but I believe we both had Jimmy G as our number one quarterback bust. Um, yeah, we did. And we will be doing a recap in a couple of weeks of our uh, bust or trust episode from the summer. So that'll be fun. But uh, Josh Gordon, only three receptions. And listen, you know, Josh Gordon's my dude. I thought he would have a better year. I know you tempered my expectations uh, many, many podcasts ago, but I'm concerned not about him. I'm concerned about the schedule. He's got to play the Bills in the championship game week 16 and the Steelers week 15. And then the Dolphins, who are a very difficult rank here with Xavier Howard on uh, week 14, just backtrack in the next, the last three weeks of the season. So if you got him as a flex play for here on out, you're in good shape. But if he's anything more than that, um, I'm concerned. And, and this is the guy, the Josh Gordon guy. Okay, I love Josh Gordon. That's my dude. And I'm concerned. So um, I don't know if you want to touch on him, but I'm just scrolling through receivers here. No, I mean, you definitely make an interesting point. Like that that matchup, even against Miami, like Edelman plays a slot. You're not going to see Xavier Howard go shadow Edelman. So I hope he does. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I so. but who's he going to shadow? It's going to be Gordon. Like it's got to be right. Yeah, um, Gordon. Gordon's going to have a rough run here at the end, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how he matches up. And you know, New England's just so unpredictable. You're back to like the New England of old. You don't know where the production's going to come from. Like it was kind of nice earlier in the year with. You know, Burkhead hurt and Edelman out for suspense. Like you knew where this the the production was going to come from with Gronk banged up. Now Gronk's back, you know, relatively he healthy. He doesn't look the same. He does not look good, right? I mean, it's, nah, honestly, I'm going to say it now. It's just so it's on record. I think this is it for him. I like, do too. I, I do too. I don't think he comes back next year. I mean, yeah. we heard he was talking about playing uh, wrestling over the summer. There was rumors about it. Vince McMahon wanting to sign him. And him going to the WWE between that and making movies and doing Gronk things. Yeah. And, um, and saving and saving money. That's a big part of this. Like he's very financially stable and he's been very financially savvy. Like I think Gronk is smart enough to think about the long term repercussions of what this is going to do to his body. I think you're right. I think this is it. I think this is it for Gronk. He's had a good run. You know, him and Brady are going to kind of go out into the sunset together. I'm not saying this is Brady's last year, but I'm not saying that, um, you know, Gronk is going to push it any further. I think he's happy having just played with Brady and doing what they did and accomplishing what they were able to accomplish. And uh, I think he's probably going to move on. And it's going to be very interesting. I mean, we could talk about the Patriots for a little bit here um, at nauseum. I'm sick of talking about them, but they're going to lose a lot of weapons at the end of the season. So you got Chris Hogan's going to be a free agent. Cordero Patterson is gone. Uh, Philip Dorsett, those three guys. I think Patterson will be back. I think Patterson will be back. My man. I think, he, I think he enjoys being in new England. I think they, you know, he's probably having fun getting to play a little bit of running back. Like he's a big part of their game plan, even though it doesn't show up in the fantasy stats, he has roles in that he's team. Very like, involved. He's the, yeah, so I, I think he's gonna like staying in New England, and uh, I I foresee him coming back on a pretty team friendly deal. That would be nice, but either way, 
his contract's over. So you figure Hogan's contract ends, Patterson's gone. Oh, you know, Patterson's contract ends. Uh, Dorsett's contract expires, and Josh Gordon's a restricted free agent. So, like, okay, maybe Patterson comes back and plays uh, special teams and does his thing, you know, manufacture uh, plays. But Edelman's signed for one more year. So, like, and then if Gronk leaves, we're looking at a, like, depleted wide receiver uh, corpse here. For no yeah, you're, gonna, you're looking at what you were looking at early in the year, which is, you know, no true wide receiver one. You're going to see, you know, Chris Hogan, like you said, his contract is up, but you were having Chris Hogan as the number one wide receiver. It just wasn't working. No. And like Brady was visibly frustrated. And, uh, you know, you'll still have Edelman there. So, you know, but he's going to hit what, 31 or 32 years old? Like he's going to start depleting and you're, you're already starting to see it a little bit. And uh, I mean, Duke can still play. I'm not going to knock him, but you know, it's, it's going to be tough sledding. Brady turns like 58 and Edelman turns like 43 and Gronk is like dead. And it's, <laughs> Gronk is limping around. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's going to be weird to see the Patriots like maybe struggle a little bit. Yeah. Well, you know, the end is coming for all of us and, uh, I guess for Brady, maybe it'll be next year. I don't know. But we said that, you know, before this season started. So, yeah, he'll probably play another five years with today's rules. Probably. So that's pretty much it on players that I wanted to touch on. Was anybody else uh, you wanted to talk about? No, no glaring. Uh, no one glaring comes to mind. Cool. So before we wrap up the show, um, just wanted to talk about some strategies that we use this past year and maybe some. Um, you know, change of direction for next year's for startups. Uh, so yeah, Nick talk just real briefly on what your, um, strategy was for last year. Cause we had very similar strategies. Yeah. I think, um, my main strategy was just thinking through, uh, kind of, you know, positional, um, uh, not even scarcity, but, uh, variation and, you know, where can I kind of cash in on opportunity? And when I'm thinking about it, you know, wide receiver ones are hard to come by, right? So you could take all the shots you want in the world and stack running backs in the beginning of a draft, but then where is your wide receiver points going to be coming from? You're going to be choosing from a pot of number two options. So my philosophy um, for this past year, and I did um, a healthy amount of startups, was kind (laughs) of try to stack, um, you know, market share in the beginning. So target share, market share, Um, But guys who were on the younger side, so guys who were 23, 24, 25, um, you know, coming into the prime of their careers, but have already established themselves, um, maybe not in the NFL as a true stud wide receiver, but they've established themselves on their depth chart as the number one option. So I was looking at guys like um, Amari Cooper in Oakland, Um, you know, without Crabtree there, he was the clear number one. Um, I was looking at guys like Corey Davis in Tennessee. You know, Taewon Taylor was not taking that role from him. Tajay Sharp was not taking that role from him. He was the clear number one. Um, and, you know, Tyreek, as much as I loved him, I was shooting for um, a guy like Sammy Watkins because they paid him wide receiver one money. Um, and I thought with maybe Kelsey and Tyreek being, you know, Tyreek and taking the top off the defense, Watkins would have maybe a good year. So those were some of the guys that I was targeting. Um, you know, and even like a Brandon Cooks, he's the number one wide receiver there in in LA. Like there were there was plenty of wide receivers up top where I wanted to t- to uh, you know cash in on that target share. And then my philosophy was let's get running backs later. So let's get some of the lower tier and running back injuries are high. So let's get some of the high profile backups. See what injuries occur throughout the year. Um, you know, something like Yeldon was my number one target. Um, and so with Fournette out so much, I was able to yield that from him and, um, you know, some other high profile backups, James Connor, um, is on 90% of my dynasty rosters and, uh, that one came up big, obviously. So, yeah, we should probably preface where you're picking in your startups. So obviously, so let me throw this at you. So yep. if you're at a top six to seven pick, I mean, you're obviously going to, you know, go running back there. Um, so I actually, I switched it up one, one draft. I was like, you know what, let me, let me take, I had the second overall pick and it was a two player copy league. And, uh, I went to Andre Hopkins. I said, let me just shore up wide receiver. Let me know what I'm doing here. 
And uh, I went DeAndre Hopkins first overall, more second overall pick, but you know, the first copy of him. And uh, I can't say that was a good decision, um, but it was one that I made at the time that I wanted to shore up market share. And uh, But I do agree, generally, if you were in the top six, you were going running back. Right, because not a lot of people play in copy leagues. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if so for me, obviously, it's the same. You know, if I'm getting a top six to seven pick, I'm going to build my team around the running back position um, because those top guys, you just, they're, they're winners. They're league winners. Um, I mean, right now, it's, it's very, it's going to be actually very interesting for next year's startups because Kareem Hunt, we didn't even touch on that. He's done so. I, I don't think he'll ever play a down ever in, in the NFL ever again. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you got a chance to watch the interview he had with ESPN, but I was not impressed with that interview. He came across, um, just very uh, not serious, uh, smirking around, and um, he wasn't prepared for that interview. He didn't look prepared. But now they have more footage of another incident. I mean, it's it's incredible. I mean, Kareem Hunt, in my opinion, was a top five running back for startups for next year, and now he's done. I mean, it's and he's 22, 23. I mean, it's crazy. Um, so I had him in the mix for uh, top six to seven picks for next year startups. But you're, for me, I'm looking at obviously Gurley Barkley or one and two for me. And then you've got, you know, CMC. Yeah, Mara. I think McCa- I think McCaffrey fits in at three right now. Right. I mean, it's especially yeah. PPR. So oh, yeah. I'll gladly put him at three. Then you've got, you know, Kamara, uh, Elliot. Um, and listen, <laughs> stop with DJ. Don't say DJ. No. Okay. All right. All right. I was, right. I was gonna Go say ahead. I was gonna say Connor because Connor is gonna be in a dope situation with Pittsburgh next year. Um, he's up there for me, Connor, and um, that's when the tier kind of breaks for me. See, right? I'm. I think I think my tier breaks a little earlier. I I'm not putting Connor in there. Yeah, I don't want to put him in that tier, but he's right. He's right below those guys. So okay. Yeah, so let's talk I'm, about that for me. Tier. Yeah. So this is like a. All right, let's talk, all right, let's talk about that first year and then let's get back to Connor because this is like a you know so, dynasty kind of outlook strategy type thing. But go ahead. So t- tier one for me is just Gurley and Barkley. They're in a league of their own. And then below it, I would put CMC and Kamara, very similar PPR backs. Um, Elliot. And Zeke. Yeah, and, and Zeke. that's it. And that, that's yeah. tier two for me. I agree. And so that's, that's kind of where I end. And if I'm not getting one of those guys... I'm looking elsewhere. Like I'm, I'm starting to look at the wide receiver position at that point. And, uh, you know, going back to, to go ahead. Oh, I was going to say uh, with Kareem hunt, I had him in the mix with CMC and Elliot. Did, did you not, or I did not. Okay. I did not. I, I just only off the point that I don't think hunt was like a great talent. Like all those guys up top are great talents. I think that's the separator. And so if I'm going to spend a high pick on a position that is more likely to get hurt and doesn't have as long of a lo- longevity as long of a longevity, <laughs> doesn't have the longevity of a wide receiver. I want a great talent. And I didn't see Kareem Hunt as that. And I don't see James Conner as that. So I'm going to leave it at those five. I do think Christian McCaffrey is up there. I do think Kamara is up there and I do think Zeke fits in that. Um, and obviously Saquon and, and Gurley are what they are. So, Okay. So we agree on those. And then and obviously, like you said, Connor would be uh, the tier below. Uh, Melvin Gordon, I'm not a big fan. I'm looking to sell him, but he's got to be in the mix there with Connor. Um, Definitely. They're they're in a tier together, Connor and, and Gordon, for sure. And and Joe Mixon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then here's where it gets fun for me. See, because- I cut it off there. Well, let me throw one guy, one more guy at you. Not Cook. It, it, it's our boy. It's Nick Chubb. Oh um, yes, definitely. Yeah, no, that that's a good call. Yep. So Chubb, Chubb and Mixon, those are the guys who I'm trying to squeeze into that third tier for next year because um, I love both of them and they're both young and productive and they can both catch the ball. So I'm actually going to squeeze, all, all can I squeeze one more in there too. Who do you got? Um, and I think this guy is, you know, just looking at ADP because I'm actually in a mock draft right now to, to um, you know, kind of put some ADP out there for the dynasty community. And Leonard Fournette didn't go until the third round. So I'm going to put Fournette in that tier two for me. He's an obvious buy going into this offseason for me. Oh, I yeah. still love the talent. He's, you know, a, a top five back. And uh, 
I mean, he's he's a beast. And not only is he the one A, he is the foundational back. He's yes. the term of a foundational back. He's not just a workhorse. He is the offense. Like their game plan is around Fournette. Hundred percent. And, and so if, if you can get that in the second round, I mean, shoot. If if you could start me in a startup, right? And I'm at the back at half of the first round, if I can start my startup. If I can start my, if I can start my team, geez Louise, if I can start my team with a guy like, you know, Odell Beckham or DeAndre Hopkins or, um, you know, one of those top tier wide receivers and then come back around the turn in the second round and grab a guy like Fournette, I'm thrilled. But the thing is, I don't even think you need to take him there. I don't even think you need to take him in the second, but I wouldn't risk leaving him to the third either. I wouldn't either. I mean, because in startups this past year, he was going high. He I was know. going, uh, and he top. should. That's that's where he should be. He should be at the very latest two hundred six. He should be two hundred six or higher. I agree. So you got him in there. Um, so yeah, we said Mixon and Chubb, um, Fournette, and then it gets interesting because then you get the guys like David Johnsons, um, who were former top five. You know. PPR backs. Can I just stop you for one second that I don't want to talk over you, but did we just name 10 backs that you'd rather have than David Johnson? We did. Oh, we did. interesting. Okay. Just, just a mental note. Proceed. And, and you know, we also named 10 more backs uh, that we like over carry on Johnson. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. But carry on Johnson's only going into the second year. So, yeah. So we'll, we'll carry on. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you got to put David Johnson in the mix. I mean, he's actually looked good the past couple weeks when they changed the offense and, um, you know, God, God hoping that next year they revolve it around him and who knows what's going on in Arizona. We don't know if uh, Fitzgerald's coming back. Um, there's really not much else going on there. Kirk is hurt. He's out for the year. Um, they don't have a tight end of, of consequence. RSJ. I mean, come on. No, he, he's um, done, man. I'm cutting the cord on RSJ. If I've got him places, you have to, he's, yeah, he didn't do anything. So much hype in the, in the you're literally holding him off two weeks his rookie year. That's yep. why you're holding him is for what he did in two weeks. It's crazy. The loyalty yep. that some people had to, to RSJ. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, then you got guys that I'm really like excited about, especially, you know, in PPR to Cohen with that offense, uh, Philip Lindsay in Denver, um, you know, Telvin, Tevin Coleman, if he's on a new team as the RB one, which, I've tempered expectations uh, after what I've seen this year. I'm very disappointed. He had his shot in Atlanta. I mean, this and, game has this past week was putrid. I mean, oh, I know it's so sad because listen, Edo Smith's a rookie and he looks better than Tevin Coleman. I mean, very disappointing for Tevin Coleman fans. I'm one of them. Uh, Aaron Jones, you know, like he's another guy. You know, in that offense in Green Bay, thank God they got rid of the freaking coach. Jeez. Um, if only Jeff Janis was still in Green Bay. Who else we got? That that's actually kind of it for me at running back. Everyone, I'm, maybe Kenyon I'm assuming, Drake. I'm assuming you've got Dalvin Cook in there. I yeah, definitely, Dal- Dalvin I would Cook. definitely have Drake in there. Drake has been really impressive to me lately, and he's probably my favorite out of that whole group that you mentioned. I really. Nope. Want no parts of that. So I loved him as a prospect and I got beat up for it because nobody liked him. And he, man, he is so good. Um, who else we got here? A lot of these guys are sharing carry. A lot of these are satellite backs. We're going into satellite back territory here. Yeah. Those, see, have, of course, we haven't talked about Jordan Howard. Oh, God. <laughs> Um, say people, if, if you're actually listening to the show still at this point, save yourselves, never draft Jordan Howard in dynasty and redraft. Just don't do it to yourself. You're, you're wasting a spot. The best outcome is 12 points because he has 60 yards and a touchdown and zero receptions. He's never, he, that's his best outcome. Come is like most of the time it's 43 yards and no touchdown and it's 4.3 points like that hurts your lineup more than it helps it like you can call him a floor player all you want he is not a floor player his floor like what you're what you think his floor is is actually his ceiling 
all these running backs that scored below him in PPR on the season so far, I'll take all of them over him. Yeah. And these are guys who played half the year, played the, the whole year. I'm just so done with Jordan Howard. Uh, you know what? And, and what's his name too? Derrick Henry. I'm so done with Derrick Henry. Like they're both, they're both the same. They're both so massively underproductive and they had their shots. It's not like Derrick Henry didn't have his shot. I mean, three yards of carry he's averaging on the season. It's it got awful. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll agree with that. Done. If, he, if he doesn't score a touchdown, he's garbage. I'm looking at these weeks where he scored a touchdown. It's it's incredible. And he still only scored 14 points. Yeah. And so here's here's kind of the lesson here is like as we hash this out, kind of in tears, you know, moving forward, looking ahead to next season, because either you're realistically you're either in the playoffs or you're not. So there's not much trade going on. There's not much team building from this point forward. Um, you know, with so many trade deadlines passed, come and gone. So we're looking forward just because, you know, we can at this point reflect and see, you know, what our strategies yielded. To me, it's like if you can shore up running back, right? You need one foundational back up top. You have to have one of those guys. Um, and if you're not getting in the top five, then you're looking at a guy like Leonard Fournette, right? Because then you're in the back half of the round and you can grab Fournette early second round. That's a good foundation to start your team at running back. And then I look to these middle tiers and I'm not really interested in any of these guys. So it's like, this is where you load up on wide receivers. So like you just keep taking market share, market share, market share, a guy like Will Fuller, right? You see this Houston offense coming on as of late with Deshaun finally getting healthy. You know, the past, they're just a team that you don't want to face right now. Imagine, imagine if Will Fuller was still healthy and in this offense, he would be lighting it up right now. And he's going to be so forgotten next year because he has. Oh, yeah. So like he's going to be such an awesome steal in startups next year. A hundred percent. And I don't care what you think about him health wise. He is 100% going to be a steal because when he is on the field and hit the chemistry that he has with Deshaun, Deshaun is a good quarterback and you're starting to see it. People faded fast on Deshaun because he wasn't yielding what they were paying for him early in the year. They are on fire right now. And if, if Fuller was in this lineup, so if you got if you can get guys like that in the middle, like Funches is falling out of favor, that's another guy who profiles big time. Like all of it's these guys in the middle fault. rounds, who would you rather have? Would you rather have Will Fuller or, you know, a guy like Jordan Howard? Oh, I mean, it's, it's, a no, it's a no brainer to me. So you need one foundational back up at the top of your draft, whether that's round one, one of those top guys, or a guy like Leonard Fournette or Connor up top in rounds two, and then come back and just. Hammer, 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 wide receiver, market share, market share, market share, guys like DJ Moore, guys like even Curtis Samuel, guys in dynamic offenses. If you can't get the top option, get a Ram or get a Panther or get a um, Chief or get, you know, there's so many guys out there that you can just hammer these good offenses, come back and just take market share, market share, market share, and then round out your roster with some high profile backups guys like TJ Yeldon. TJ Yeldon is going to be shifting spots this off season. I think there's a good shot. He gets a one B role somewhere like these what guys. His role this year was a one B role. Yeah. And guys like Latavius Murray, you see what he's doing. And I know Russ is feeling oh, no. on Latavius Murray. We're not going to talk about Latavius Murray. You <laughs> see, you see what he does when Dalvin cook was out. Like he was a solid running back guys like where yeah, for two inv- weeks, he was a solid running back. I know for two weeks, but those were two impactful weeks. Like he was a plug and play guy, a guy like Alfred blue. I got two starts out out of Alfred blue. I got two starts out of Latavius Murray. I'm now getting starts out of, um, Spencer Ware. like, so so, uh, let me correct myself three weeks. So week six, seven and eight scored 20 points a pop. Yeah. But here, but here's those are are impact weeks though. Okay. But what, what what are we talking about? Guys like Latavius Murray, what are we doing with these guys? Cause okay. For one, you're getting them late, right? So that's awesome. Mm-hmm. You, you're, it's such a steal. You're getting them late. Exactly. But you're going to start them. You didn't start. I know you did, but most teams aren't going to start them that first week where he scored 20 points because he's on the bench and it's unexpected. So you're going to get one or two starts on average per year with these guys. Why? Here's my question. Why not flip him to the Dalvin Cook owner and, you know, get more than you drafted him oh. for? So look, I'm not saying don't. I'm saying that you draft those guys with the intention to do that as soon as they because once those guys go down where there's concern, 
all of a sudden their value spikes and they become more than what you paid. You didn't, you held on to these guys all year. You held on to uh, Latavius. No, no, I didn't. In half the leagues, I sold Latavius. Oh, okay. Because a couple leagues were in, you still have them. Oh, yeah. In a couple leagues, it depends. So it depends on my situation. Like if I had guys and I just was using them as a flex, I flipped them. If I needed them the spot start, like a lot of leagues, I took Chubb high. Like I took Chubb in round five because I wasn't letting him slip through my fingertips. So in a lot of leagues, I didn't have that second foundational back, right? Because I took Chubb in the fifth round. Like I stretched for Chubb because I knew what he was going to be and I was willing to do a productive struggle. In those leagues, guys like Latavius Murray and TJ Yeldon saved me because I was able to get spot starts. Gio Bernard, I was able to get spot starts out of those guys until Chubb came around. And now at this point, if, if any of those guys were to spike in value, that's when I send them off. Okay. that That's fair. That That's yeah. what I would be doing as well. Um, I would definitely would not be holding these guys for long term because there is no. No, but Latavius Murray, he's he's the kind of guy who he still has value. Like you're seeing late in the games, Dal- Dalvin Cook is not a foundational back. They're not giving him those late game carries. Ooh. Who comes in to churn the clock? It's Latavius. That's, that's tough. I love Dalvin Cook. Um you don't think he's a foundation back? You don't think he's uh, like a three-down back? Look where I mean, they're the, going to at the end of the game. They're going to Latavius. Pull up Latavius' stats right now. So, okay, so four, So here's the past four weeks of um, carries with Dalvin Cook in the game. Four, 11, four, and 10. Yeah, so he, he's going to be game script dependent, but you kind of know Minnesota is a pretty predictable team. You know when they're going to be in a game or when they're going to have to duke it out, right? So... If you're playing an offense who likes to stretch the field and is going to put up points, um, they're going to struggle. They're going to be in a shootout with those types of teams because Kirk is a gunslinger, right? So he wants to throw the ball all over the field and try to put points up. So in those tight matchups, you're you're not going to have Latavius as an option. But for a what-the-heck flex on a, on a team like the Bills or teams that are tough that stack the box, right, and you're already up, those are the games that they're going to Latavius. He still has value. Like he is not a useless piece. Yeah. I, if I'm rebuilding, he's useless to me. Um, if I'm a contender and I don't have Cook, he's useless to me. Like, but see, only- I, I would disagree with you because if you're rebuilding, if you can catch a guy like Latavius like for free, as soon as all of a sudden he gets that spike in value, that's what you're looking for. You can, you can stockpile or even make incremental trades take a third and package it with Latavius and move up to a second. Like oh, those yeah. guys have value. Like those but are, at that it's, point, it can't just be one for one all the time. You've got to think about the incremental moves, especially when you're rebuilding. A lot oh, of these guys you can flip Kenyon Barner. I was able to, I was able to flip Kenyon Barner three times this year for a third. Wow. Somebody wanted Kenyon Barner. I mean, seriously, as soon as, soon as Sony Michelle went down, Ugh. who was the next man up? It was Kenyon Barner. Coral I, Patterson. Well, yeah, and no one saw that coming, but guess what? I cashed out on Barner as soon as I got a chance. Th- those are the types of moves, and now I have extra thirds and three leagues. Right. And guess what? I'll package them with my third and try to get up to a late second. Like that's Those are the types of incremental moves that you make. Right, I agree. I'm, when we're talking about flipping Murray and guys like Latavius, I'm 100% agreeing with you. you got to flip them. But like you know, it's week 14. The regular season's over. You should have flipped them by now different story because you're going to get them late again next year and then you got to flip them again um so yeah i agree with with the plan i just don't like him as a player uh who else we got here i mean that as far as strategy that that's pretty much it for me i mean i'm looking to build my teams around rb1s if i'm a top pick against about those uh, elite running backs we talked about and then if not if i'm at the bottom of the first round wide receivers, you know, zero running back all the way. And I'll, you know, duct tape and band aid and patch them up as I go uh, in the late round. So, and that's the thing, these studs, I mean, if you don't have one, good luck, right? Like, so if you don't have one, don't try to chase the next, you know, the next tier. Like you, you have to go into these drafts with a plan. Like these stud running backs, like we say tier one is, Gurley and Barkley alone, but tier one in your draft should be all five of those running backs. And if you don't get one of those five, like don't go chasing a Connor with pick six or seven. Like that is not going to turn out well. You're going to run into a buzzsaw with one of those five backs. So just accept and embrace the productive struggle and go get a wide receiver that's going to give you a runway. And then like you were saying, band-aid and then 
go, I don't even know, do whatever you want to do. Buy some draft guides, go get Waldman or go get, you know, whoever you got to get, but draft well, because running backs are a dime a dozen in reality of things. It almost makes me wonder, you know, the teams that had the 101 this year, everybody was taking Gurley at the 101. I want to see what those teams look like, because honestly, it looks like those teams are the playoff teams. Like if you had the 101 in 2018 at any startup and you got Gurley, there's no way you're not in the postseason right now. I mean, he's uh, yeah, 30 points a week. So it makes me think, and, you know, fast forward to next year, we both agree it's Saquon and Gurley next year. Um, I'm almost looking to do some type of auction format for a startup. Like, because if I don't get the 101 or 102 next year, you know, I mean, it's just like, eh. You know, especially, I mean, you got to go Barkley because the runway on Barkley is like incredible, right? I mean, and even just as a talent, like, I don't even know that there's really a comparison between Barkley and Gurley talent wise. Like, I'm not saying Gurley's not a freak, Gurley is, is an incredible talent, but there is just something about Barkley that is so much more different. So, there's just something about Saquon, right? Like, you look at him and he's just so special. Like his ability to create, you don't really see that at a girlie's runs. It's not that he doesn't have it, but it's just Saquon has some sort of ability that you just haven't really seen in the NFL in a long time. His ability to to not only make that first man miss, but then to create. And that was the knock on Saquon sometimes is that he doesn't take the easy yards. Like, like so you give him two or three yards in, in a play, he doesn't always take ease. He's kind of looking to hit that home run, but that's what makes Saquon Saquon. Like, I'm not mad about that. I'll take the two yard losses when he can bust a 40 yard run that he should never have gotten. It reminds me of the old Barry Sanders. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. (laughs) You know, I mean, I lived through it for 10 years. Uh, Of course, I was the Barry guy. He's right there. Yeah. Thanks to my girlfriend. She got me that for uh, our anniversary. But. Very similar. Uh, you said and creates his own space. He creates his own run. So he's so creative as a runner. Um, and Gurley is that smash mouth, albeit I believe he's better than Emma Smith. But um, it's just an interesting, um, you know, comparison because those two are Hall of Famers, Barry and Emmett. But uh, from the looks of it, uh, both Gurley and Saquon both look like Hall of Fame uh, running backs. But listen, but, uh, yes. I, we can't just compare these two guys to Hall of Fame talents without saying that Amari Cooper reminds me a lot of Michael Irvin and the impact that he has had on the Dallas Cowboys. What? <laughs> Michael Irvin? Oh, my gosh. That's what Jerry Jones said. Hey, I'm just taking, I'm just taking the words from the great one. So. Did he? Re- Jerry Jones said that? Oh, yeah. He said the impact that Cooper's had on the Cowboys is Michael Irvin-esque. I mean, he better say that. He gave him a first-round pick. for. Uh, I mean, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Uh, you know, we might as well talk about Cooper before we go because uh, it's time to go. But uh, <laughs> I know you love Cooper. You're wearing the jersey. We might as well talk about him for like two seconds here. Um, love him. That's all I have yeah. to say. I love him. That's I love it. I'm As a Cowboy fan, I love him. I love him. I was I was hard on him. Um, I still haven't really changed my tune. I mean, he is what he is. He's Amari Cooper. Uh, so, but you know, and we just talked about Gurley. We got to talk about Cooper in the uh, the mindset of the draft and where he was going. Because here's why I think we're so frustrated. I mean, the anti Cooper people are so frustrated because he was going 101 in that year's rookie draft and coming out of college because of his injury with Gurley. Uh, was not a surefire lock 101. It was Cooper, Gurley, A.B. And, um, I, you know, in, in a few leagues, <laughs> in the NFL Max League, I got him at 102, and Cooper went 101. So that plays a major role into the expectation of what Cooper was supposed to be. And I think that that has to play a role in my, you know, argument against him because of the what the cost it's baked in to his yeah, career in the dynasty. Yes, I agree. And so, like, for me, I'm coming more out of the mindset from a dynasty perspective of, like, this past year is, like, where where was he valued in a startup? Like, you're getting a top 10 pick, 
And the guy had produced for two years. Like it wasn't phenomenal, but he was on a good career arc. And then all of a sudden he has one, one down year. And just like I was saying earlier is like, I'll invest in that beat down stock. Like Amari Cooper is, you know, and I know you're changing. You, you, you say he is what he is, but I know that, you know, football. And so, you know, he is actually a good football player. Like he is a good football player and he has he talent. Player. Yeah, he is. As yeah, far as he, fantasy goes, it's a different story. Exactly. But, but as a football player. player, he has talent. And so if I'm going to get him for a third round startup pick, like, yeah, that, that was worth it to me. That was something that I was willing to invest in as a third round pick. Someone who was on a good career arc, just in a beaten down stock. That seems like, you know, who was a former first round startup pick. That seemed like a good bet for me um, to, to return value. And you're starting to see his values climb back and it, it I can't say it was a bad decision. Yeah, I was looking to sell my Amari Cooper shares. I was looking to cash out. I wanted out over the summer. However, at you know, at what price? So like you're you got him in startups in the third round. So in for 2018 rookie picks, um, in my opinion, he was worth more than a late first, two late firsts, say, or like 201 and a, and a 108. Um, did that equate to a third round startup? I don't think so. Cause I mean, right now he's definitely worth more on, on the trade market. Uh, I would assume he, you could, you know, it's going to take that, three, three first round picks to get that, it. That's the other point is like a couple of weeks ago, we were talking on a pod and it was like, would I trade a first for Cooper? Yeah. Like that was the price to get him. It was like very low. Like his stock was extremely beaten down. And so, he was a buy for me. And I said that on here and it was, you know, even at that point, I meant it. Like he was a buy. I, I just, that pedigree, his talent and that situation was toxic. And I knew as soon as he switched and I didn't know it was going to be to Dallas and I didn't know it would turn out this well because so far it has worked out pretty well for them. Uh, you know, but I just knew once he got out of that situation, just felt like he was going to be back to being motivated. Sometimes guys just do need a change, change of scenery. That is a real thing. Like sometimes you just become unmotivated in your work environment, especially if it's toxic, if it's toxic. It's true. I agree. And he's helping Zeke out. So, you know, that makes me happy, but that'll be it for the show. Um, before we go final thoughts, uh, if you have anything, mine would be, um, week 13's over regular season's gone. Congratulations to you guys who are in the postseason because this is it. Like you work hard all year and over the summer, you create your draft boards. And if you got to the postseason, you did your job. Uh, from here on out, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, let the fantasy football gods take care of it. But uh, you did your job, you got to the postseason, and you can only control what you can control, and that's getting there. Um, there's three weeks left and who knows? We've I've seen some of the best teams in the league in my leagues uh, lose, and some of the worst of the playoff teams win. It's just a matter of getting hot, and um, you're all winners. You know, if you get in, you're all winners. Because um, again, we're gambling here; we're playing a fake fake sport. But uh, that was my final thought, just to congratulate everybody who got to the postseason because it's not easy to do, um, and it's in your control. You have the opportunity to do it via trade waiver wire addition and uh you know your draft so uh kudos to you guys out there what about you nick any final thoughts yeah um i mean again just like russ was saying reiterate you know good luck um if you're in the fantasy playoffs um you know i'm, I'm never one that roots for injuries even to my you know league mates because i think that you know in the playoffs it should be the best teams battling it out like I want my team to go against another team full strength because that's that's the fun part, right? Like we're playing a game. You don't want to just smash everyone. I mean, you may want to if it's a big money league, but um, you know, in general, you want it to be fun. Like you want that feeling of being on the edge of your seat. Like I just lost um, one of my first round playoff games by 0. 0.6 points, and I had Connor going in that Monday night game. And as soon as he went out, it was just like you know, devastating, but it's fun. You know, it was fun to sit on the edge of my couch and, you know, pray that he got back in, like, come on, Connor, get back in, get back in, get back in. And uh, ultimately it didn't work out for me, but that's the fun part about fantasy is like, it's crazy how many different constructions there are, but there's so many different ways to skin the cat, so to speak. Right. So how close these matchups end up getting 
is, uh, you know, that, that makes for the fun of it. And, you know, you've got to remember you want to win, but so does everyone else. And, you know, typically six teams will make the playoffs all they're deserving to be there. So you don't really want to wish injury upon people. So may the injury bug stay away from you. Um, and for all players, um, in general and, uh, best of luck and, you know, don't ignore the waiver wire because you never know in a time of need or a time of frenzy who might hit the waiver wire if something does go awry. Jeffrey Wilson. Go get him. That'll be it for the show. Like I said, um, just want to thank everybody out there for listening, for watching. And um, we appreciate the viewers and um, share the link if you can. Um, YouTube.com backslash NFL max share with your friends and help us get some more subscribers. And I will be working on some more stuff um, over the next couple of weeks. And um you know, adding a, a new format for uh, for 2019, but uh, and, and we'll be pumping out shows. We'll be pumping out shows weekly. You won't go a couple weeks again um, without shows, especially into the off season. That's like my favorite time of the year. So even if Russ can't get on or we have scheduling conflicts, we'll make it happen for you guys. We'll get you a show weekly, um, at least. And even as little news pops up in the off season, um, you know, if I have to jump on for five minutes just to touch on what the impact is, I'll do that. So we're gonna have some stuff coming out for you. So again, please just subscribe. Uh, make sure you get the link out. You know, if you got friends or league mates, don't be selfish with information. Um, you know, it's always fun to share and different people have different tastes. So there's no even saying that they'll cling to any information that comes from here. So absolutely. And click that little bell in your subscription next to the subscribe button. And we'll be doing some uh, live streaming podcasts uh, over the off season as well. So that'll be it. Uh, thanks again for the hot pineapples. This is the Ewok juggernauts. Everybody one clap. Thanks guys. I mean, for me, that's where the value comes is like, I want you pissed off because as soon as your player gets hurt, I'm going to come calling to you. I'm not a big fan of John Ross, but I'm a big fan of that 4-2-2 speed. Oh, uh, we lost Nick. I dropped right. off. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Man, I was on a roll, too. I like that one. I tell you, it's the Amari Cooper jersey. It's just... <laughs> I don't even like Jeff Wilson, but God forbid he does this every week now because he's going to get peppered. Yeah. Markets. I don't understand. Maybe you can help me understand this. Sure. Why, why are these guys on a team? Number four. I'm like, yeah, no, prize went up. Yeah, sorry. Smash accept and proud <laughs> pick. Welcome to a refurbished computer. <laughs> is that what it is? Okay. Whatever you want to do. Just stop flow with it. Okay. You, you know how good I am. Just going with the flow. Going with the flow, baby. <laughs> Foster. Oh Foster. Oh, that just shows you how important he is on my list. Yeah, right? We're, clearly, we have to touch on him. All right. Don't put this in the outtakes. You hear me? Okay. If you say you don't put it, I won't put it. All right. Don't put it. I, I just don't understand the logic here. Like with all these guys. All right, fine. You know what? Just for you, Merry Christmas. All right, thank you. This, this is gonna be Tuesday. I, mean, I just don't get it. Like, <laughs> what? What's the point? Yeah. So yeah, Robert Foster and um, Zay Jones. I mean, listen, this, this passing attack is uh, not much to talk about. Special edition tonight with Amari Cooper as a guest on NFL Max Radio. Amari, how are you doing tonight? Fantastic. <laughs> I couldn't be better. I'm thrilled to be a cowboy. I'm doing what I was always meant to do. Play football and be really good at it. And be awesome at route running. That's right. Because we get points per route run. Oh Thanks. my gosh, shut up. Nick doing a, a little modeling session for us. That's right. <laughs> the catwalk. Oh, gosh. <laughs> All right. Uh, Very wrong. Jump right into it. <clears throat> NFL Max Radio broadcasting live tonight.
all that. Yeah, but I would have given you the Godfather deal on that guy. I know. I mean, I'm what like, did I offer you? I offered you two first round picks. Well, it was Keenan Allen. So what do you like better? Two first or Keenan? Keenan probably. Yeah. Yeah. So it would have been Keenan, Devin Funches, um, Evan Ingram. Yeah, it was a haul. And then I, you know, if I I feel like I didn't have you on the ropes. If I felt like I had you on the ropes, I would have threw in like a Marquise Goodwin or a second round or something. Because really, if you had thrown in Goodwin, I probably would have done it. Really? Why did probably. you tell me that? I would have taken the shot. I felt I like I didn't have you on the ropes. I didn't think you would go there. Dude, I told you I wanted him so bad. Yeah, but I'm not trading him now in the offseason. No, I don't want him now. Yeah, I would have traded you to make your run. Right. That was the whole point. Yeah. I'm not paying that price now. Forget it. But he's worth it, though. 